So we're going to pull out our notes. Does anybody need a copy of notes? All right. If not, we're on page number four of our notes. And uh, I'm going to try to be mindful and stop and plenty of time to give you the talk, time to talk, and to get all of us uh, on a good schedule to uh, be able to be up here and, you know, on our mind. So just set that up for you all right, I think I read this paragraph last week, but I'm going to jump back and read it just to be able to flow into tonight. It's where we start. We have a lot to shout about. Our God is a mighty God. He is worthy to be worshipped. He is great and greatly to be praised. If we spend every waking moment uttering words of praise to Him, it would not be enough. Amen. Simply... Uh, you know, to put, put a realm on worship to God. Uh, there's no realm to put on that. There's just not enough time, not enough worship, not enough energy to be able to give God all the work, glory and honor and praise that He's doing. But you know what? One day in eternity, we're going to be able to catch up, aren't we? Amen. As we uh, worship Him throughout the endless age. Let's move on. Let's talk about the story the, about the Jericho story in Joshua chapter number six. The people had to shout. They had to shout for the walls to come down. The power was not in their shout alone. God could have crumpled the walls without, without. Without their shout. But it was their obedience. O-B-E-D-I-E-N-C-E. -E. O-B-E-D-I-E-N-C-E. -E. It was their obedience. Their act of worship that God wanted. Let's just stop there for a few moments. Amen. God loves when we are obedient to Him. Amen. On so many realms. Brother Craig, you said it tonight when you were talking to uh, that individual. Uh, I can't, you know, I don't know what God's will is for every individual. God knows what is His specific will and His timing and His leading for folks. There are seasons to some things. Some folks' season is shorter or longer. You know, we have to know uh, as we seek God with the events of our life. But there is that of knowing that when God's word speaks to us, we've got to be obedient to it. Amen. So our highest act of worship, I believe, is obedience to God. So as they marched around the wall, you know, seven days, and uh, there was a coming together, there was a unifying, there was that of being quiet, then there was that of shouting. Uh, there was complete obedience to God. God can do anything He wants. But most often, God really just wants us to be obedient and not lose the hand of God. Because our worship really is a high act of obedience to God. Some of us have walls in our lives. We need to shout them down. We say, if God does this for me, I will shout. Israel waited, if Israel waited until the walls were down to shout, it would have never happened. How many of us like to shout the praises of God when something happens? And that's usually when we most hear testimony. That's usually when we're most excited, when we know it's evidence to us that God has done something. But really, when we think about those children of Israel marching around the wall, God commanded them to shout. The shout was worship. The shout was to God. And the shout was before the wall fell, before they even seen. This wall wasn't, I mean, we're not talking about a fence. We're not talking about a picket fence. We're not talking about a barbed bar wire fence. We're talking about a wall that chariots could drive across the top, uh, a wall that was wide and was high. And so God uh, was able to move that, but their shout was to come before God moved that. Now in our Pentecostal realm, we would use the word shout when we talk about our worship. Um, we shout, um, maybe dancing, maybe 
uh, lifting of our hands, maybe running the aisles, whatever that is. But how many times have we ever just in obedience to God because of who He is and what He's done, we're obedient to the shout even before we see the walls come down? I've told you this before. I was challenged by my, uh, my, my boss at work by her testimony when she said that she went to revival. And she told me, she looked at me and she said, Robert, she said, you should have seen me in church. She said, the, the evangelist said, what would it look like if God had already answered my prayer? And she said, I was standing on my feet. She said, and I just took off dancing everywhere. She said, because this is what it would look like if God answered my prayer. Sometimes we need to shout, not because God has answered our prayer, but in, but in obedience and worship to God because we know what He can do. We talked already in these preceding weeks of really what true worship is. Worship is worshiping God even when things aren't going wrong. We look at the life of, 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 of Joseph. We look at the life of Job. We look at the Seraphonician woman. We look at those who came with, with their hands and uh, blinded eyes with wooden legs. We look at uh, Jairus as he comes to see his daughter. Uh, God working his daughter who's dead. Um, they all come in an act of worship first. Sometimes we don't know the outcomes. None of us have this crystal ball that we can rub and look at the outcomes of things. People like that. That's why people love, uh, I have a co-worker, she loves to watch shows about these mediums, and she said, I know you don't believe in that, but blah, 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 blah. You know, no, I, I, I don't need a medium to tell me what, what's going to happen in my life. I trust God with the details of my life. Amen. And so as we trust God, we should be able to worship Him. No matter what the outcome is, God is still going to be God. And, I, you know, really, Sister Tina's testimony on Sunday morning was just, it was powerful because it was a reminder to us that through the changes and seasons of life, and some of them are really big changes, um, that God is still the same. And that relationship with God will maintain when all other relationships fail. Amen. I think that became most powerful, Brother Doug, when your mom passed away. For me, I, there was just an enlightenment of knowing that there's a breach in earthly relationships, but there's no breach in her relationship with God. Amen. There is no breach. Amen. And so no matter what the outcome is, God is still worthy to be worshipped. And so I want us to put on our glasses of worship and worship Him and shout not when things have already happened, but worship Him even before they happen because it's an act of obedience. God commands us to worship. God commands us to worship. And He wants our worship. All right. This kind of shifts gears here. And uh, you folks are good givers, and thank you for that. But it's just a fresh reminder in our life, life of, of this. Paying, P-A-Y-I-N-G, paying and giving, uh, paying our tithe, I'm sorry, paying our tithe and giving offerings, giving offerings is an act, is an act of worship. Paying our tithe and giving offerings is an act of worship. God speaks to us in the book of Malachi the last book of the Old Testament. He first, he reprimands, reprimands, R-E-P-R-I-M-A-N-D-S, reprimands those who bring pitiful, pitiful, P-I-T-I-F-U-L, pitiful offerings or the rejects. He declares he will not accept. He will not accept that kind of offering. We, like the children of Israel, complain about giving and say, what a weariness it is. Does this sound familiar? I want you to stop right here. I probably say every one of us 
have probably been here to some extent before. I'm weary of going to church. I'm tired of doing everything for everybody else. We probably have all felt that way to some extent, whether we said these words or whether we said similar words or whether this thought has been produced in our mind. But God says, should I accept, A-C-C-E-P-T, this of your hand? What does 2 Corinthians 9, 7 say? God loveth a cheerful giver. Amen. God loveth a cheerful giver. We need an attitude adjustment. A-T-T-I-T-U-D-E. Attitude adjustment. A-D-J-U-S-T-M-E-N-T. Sometimes we all have to give ourselves a pep talk. Sometimes it's the Word of God that convicts us. Sometimes it's church attendance and we realize that we're so much better off being here when maybe we would have said, do we have to go again? I'm tired. Or I was just there on Sunday. There's a short stretch between Sunday and Tuesday. Any of you know that? Amen. We might as well in our house just put our, our work hats on the hanger and our work boots in the closet because from Saturday night to Wednesday evening, life is just... Whew. And you all are like that too. You're sharing the same boat as us. Amen. And so sometimes we can get weary. But sometimes we need to give ourselves an attitude adjustment. We do it because it's an act of worship to God. And you know, here in our church, we do have services Sunday morning, Sunday night, Tuesday night. And it's so little in the comparison of what God deserves, isn't it? Right. Amen. But every opportunity to be at church is an opportunity of worship. Amen. And it's being here and it's giving of our time. And it's the giving of our worship and praise that God wants. Our worship that is in the giving of our heart, the giving of our spirit, and our giving of ourselves to one another, the giving of ourselves to God, the singing that brings worship to God, the hand clapping that brings worship to God, the lifting up of our hearts by the lifting up of our hands that brings worship to God. It's the hearing of the word and delightfully hearing and applying it to our life and then being obedient, which that obedience brings worship to God. So the whole realm of everything is worship unto God. And God wants our worship. Amen. God wants our worship in the good, the bad, the ugly. God wants our worship in the happy and the sad. God wants our worship when we're feeling like it. And God wants our worship when we're not feeling like it. So in every realm of life, God wants our worship. And this certainly tonight is an opportunity to worship. And let me just say, you're worshiping good. I love the testimonies. I noticed folks getting in with folks when they were testifying. I heard the singing and I, 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 I didn't look around, but I'm sure there were hands raised and there were hearts raised. God loves that tonight. He wants your worship. He wants it from a joyful heart. So sometimes we have to give ourselves an attitude adjustment. In the third chapter of Malachi, God tells us that when we don't pay tithes and give offering, that we are robbing, R-O-B-B-I-N-G, robbing him. I think I can say confidently in here, I know you folks well enough, I would trust you with holding my wallet because I know you wouldn't rob. Because you're not that nature, you're not that character. But we don't want to rob from God either in the giving of worship. I know it's, we're talking here about our tithe and our offering. But we just want to give to God in our obedience. We don't want to be disobedient in any of area of our life because it's robbing from God. So our notes say, robbing God would be disobedience. Disobedience is not worship. We are cursed, C-U-R-S-E-D, with a curse when we rob God. Not paying tithes and offering, giving offering, uh, giving offerings an act of worship to God, but it proclaims God's blessing upon us.
You know, I share a little bit Sunday night. Part of why I want to do Sunday morning is because, uh, you know, we always stop for a potty break when we're coming from West Virginia. Yeah, for us too, but for our girls, you know, and this potty training thing. And so um, I said to my wife, I'm like, I'm going to get a card for uh, Cracker Barrel. Let's just go to Cracker Barrel. Instead of stopping anywhere else, you know, a store or something, let's just stop there. Uh, Brenda the other night, she just wanted to go out to eat a couple weeks ago, and we don't do that real often, especially when we sit down. So I said, we'll take this opportunity, we'll go get something to eat, and do our little potty break. We had a great time. You know, we were just enjoying. Our waitress was so very nice to us. And, and uh, she, uh, she, did she have twin children? Oh, it was it her? She had twin children, I think. Was that? She was a twin, I think. She was a twin. And so she was just asking about our girls being twins, and we just enjoying our meal. And, uh, and, and so the, the neighbor next door to us, he came over to us, he was an older man, and uh, he said to us, he said, hey, so I overheard your conversation that these girls are twins. And uh, he said, I'm a twin too, I'm a twin sister. And would you believe people would ask us, are we identical? <laughs> he said, I would just say, yeah, we're identical. And so we were, we were, <laughs> we were, we were talking, and, and I said, so you know, uh, uh, you, 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 he said, well, unfortunately, she passed away. You know, uh, we we just begin to share the word of God, or we just begin to share it, not from the word of God, but just we begin to share. It, it was a nice conversation. It closed, and they were with their family, and they got up ready to leave. And uh, so all of a sudden, when they were leaving, all of a sudden, his wife turned around and she held her hand to me. I'm like, she goes, this is for you. I'm like, no. no. And, and she said, uh, no, she said, uh, the Spirit of God told me to give this to you. We put this on the altar in our church, and um, I asked God to direct me, and when I was walking out, God told me I need to give this to you. I'm like, well, you don't need to do that. And it was just a small something, and uh, I, I just said to her, I said, so you're a Christian. I said, Tell me a little bit about your relationship with God. That I like to hear people's story. My wife always says, you like to always ask me, tell me about it. And so I, and she began to share with me about how that, you know, God had been good to them. That their daughter had been a missionary in Kenya. And she said, when my daughter was six months pregnant with our first grandchild, she left for Kenya to be a missionary. I'm like, wow. I said, that had to be very difficult for you. She said it was. She said, especially when she got over there. And she said, let me tell you our miracle. She said, my daughter lost all of her fluid that was around the baby. And it, it, was it six months? I think it was six months. She said, so the doctors told them that, um, you know, this baby will probably never live. And if it does live, it will never function. She said, so can you imagine my daughter being in Kenya, and I'm here, and um, she said, I did go over to visit her, though. She said, I went over there. And uh, she said, and let me just tell you, that girl on the end was our granddaughter. You know, they said she would never write, that she would never be right. She said, and she's perfectly normal in every way. And it Amen. Amen. You know what? The blessing wasn't the ble we were blessed. It was it was it was a minimal amount, but it blessed me. You know what the greatest blessing was? That I made that connect with her. And God just reminded me of his care and his love for me. Even when we're busy about life. You know, we had a busy weekend. We preached out. We visited family. But it was 1 o'clock in the morning, getting to bed, and up early. And just, you know, it was busy, Brother Doug. But in the middle of the day, just to remind me that God loves me. But that woman with tears in her eyes shared the story of who she is and what God is doing in her life. And I can see the blessing upon her as we begin to collaborate. And we are the people of God. Let me tell you what, that was 
giving. And that was an act of worship. It was more than the monetary. It was the testimony of what God had done in her family's life. She surrendered her children to go to the mission field. Amen. She surrendered her baby grandchild, who she missed much of the early life because of the mission field, but she was willing to give. I want to tell you tonight that when we give to God as an act of worship, whether it's in our giving to God, which we should give, let me just tell you, Brother Seville doesn't set the rule of giving 10% of your income. God has set the standard. Amen. I, I'm a pastor. I do no different than you do. I give my 10%. Uh, someone said to me before, uh, Brother Dennis, someone said to me, well, that's like paying yourself. <laughs> that's not like paying myself. That is giving to God what is God's. That has nothing to do with my revenue and my, my income. It has to do with my worship to God and most of all my obedience to God. So I give that to Him, not because uh, I'm the pastor, but because I love God and I worship Him. And there's blessings in giving to Him. And I don't give it grudgingly. I don't even think about it. It's, it's just the way it is when, 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 when the paycheck comes in that that's what we we do. You folks know that as well. And what a blessing to be able to worship God in our tithe and our offering. And you know what? There's some times that we're just able to give more to God and we should be giving more to God. And we're able to give more to other people. It's a gift. When we give to other people, don't do it that you may have a pat on the back and you may get accolades, but do it as unto the Lord. You see someone who's in need, the Word of God declares to us that we should, if we see our neighbor in need, that we should give our clothes. We should give what we have. No, I don't want to go and look through my cupboards and find the outdated can of apple pie filling and give to my neighbor. Or go look through and I don't like Snickers, so I pull the Snickers before I out of the cabinet. You know, whatever it is, no, but giving and giving our best is unto the Lord. And it's not just in our time. You know, when God gets in our wallet, I believe this wholeheartedly, when we allow God in our wallet, it's a lot easier to allow Him into other areas of our life. You know, every area, just to be able to give to God, life is busy. Life is cumbersome. How many of you, um, and I feel like I'm kind of going down right but let me just say something for a moment. You know, I, at my job, I get to talk to a lot of older people. And I love that. I, you know, I had older, I was the youngest of grandchildren, and so I, I my grandparents were older than when I was young. And I, I love that. You know, I love just old people. I love, I love to listen to them. Um, I, I just, I like to connect. But most of them will tell you that things have changed in our society. We don't know the neighbor down the street um, where it used to be everybody knew everybody in the neighborhood. Well, there's a lot to be attributed to that, but most folks would say that most of it is, is because we're just all so busy. You know, we're busy. I think that's the problem in our life. We're so busy with so many things that it distracts us from our obedience to God. But we need to be obedient to God in every area of our life because really it's the highest act of worship we can give. Once again, going back to Saul, when God told him to destroy everything of the Amalekites, but he kept the best. God wasn't looking for the best to be kept as an act of worship to him. God was looking for obedience. God wants our obedience. And I look at the life of Joseph, and in so many times being put behind, you know, the theme of his life is suffering before stepping. Brother Doug, but every step of the way, he was obedient to God. You know, he was obedient even in running for Potiphar's wife. He was obedient to prison. He was obedient with what God had given him, even when his family misunderstood. And even was jealous, he was still obedient. God is looking for our obedience. And Job was obedient to God. 
when, 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 when God uh, allowed things to happen in his life, he was still just simply obedient. I look at the ten lepers as they went their way, they went healed, but they were obedient to God, and their obedience brought blessing upon them. You know, it was the act of obedience as the le lepers went away. The obedience was worship, and then we find worship being tra transpired uh, as that one came back to fall down at the feet of Jesus. So obedience really is worship tonight. Obedience in every area of our life. The next line is this, that God will refine us and purge us like silver and gold that we might offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. How many of you have a purge in your house? You know, there comes a time, maybe spring is a purge time, where, you know, uh, you get rid of that, which you got used or, you know, purging, uh, refining, you know, bringing down to perfection. Do you know that God does that in our life? And that becomes our highest act of worship to Him as we're obedient in the purging of our life. You know, there are things that sometimes God cuts off. There are things that God sometimes will remove. But know this, that in everything of your life, the purging that God is refining you. And as you allow Him to refine you, it's a high act of worship as you are obedient to God. I'm going to finish up this, um, this next sentence and I'm going to stop. We give of ourselves. We give of ourselves. We give to others. We give to God. And we worship Him. We give of ourselves, we give to others, we give to God, and we worship Him. I'm just going to stop with that. You know, to some people it's not that you be able to put some type of monetary gift in an offering plate, or even to others. But the real giving of ourselves is giving where we discipline ourselves to be able to give that act. You know, sometimes my giving, if I give something to you, Sister God, um, it's, it's a giving, not just to you, but it's a giving for the glorification of God. And likewise, it's just about you're a huge giver. Your heart is as big as can be. But it's not just a gift, but that's an act of worship to God. And as we give to God, we give Him everything. We give Him the shop before the walls come down. We give Him the worship in the difficult times, not just in the good times. It's our obedience that is a real act of worship to God. Amen. Does anyone have anything they want to say? I want to close out there. So I couldn't have everything clean that you were sharing about the children of Israel marching around the city of Jericho and how that for the first six days they were to be very quiet. And and part of that I wondered if it wasn't because they were chronic complainers. And if you're quiet, you can't say anything. You can't have the people marching next to you. You can't talk about who's so tired. And they were chronic complainers, so that would line up, yeah. And David said in Psalm 46, 10, be still. And know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. And I know I've said this before, but I don't have any trouble knowing that He is God, but it's the being still part that I struggle with. Uh, because if there's nothing that I can possibly do to change the situation, it's my nature to still look for something. <laughs> I might improve it a little bit. And yet, sometimes our greatest obedience is just 